Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. Once again, thank you for your children that are here tonight to study. We are praying, Lord, you reveal Christ to everyone tonight in Jesus' name. And we pray that the revelation of Christ will change and transform our lives. Do good in the lives of your children. And through us, do good in the lives of other people. In Jesus' name we pray. I welcome you to the study tonight. And in particular, I welcome you to seeing the reaction of John the Beloved to the vision of Christ that he saw. If you were here last week in our study, you will see that John saw the vision of the Lord. I need to remind you that John was undergoing persecution. In fact, the church at that time was undergoing persecution in Asia Minor. And so Jesus Christ came to reveal himself so he could encourage and reassure John, the beloved, as to what was going on. And that the victory eventually belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because at last, before you close the book of Revelation, you'll find that he'll be king of kings and lord of lords. And so to comfort John and reassure him, the Lord revealed himself unto John. And then he said, it was on the Lord's day. If you look at verse 10, chapter 1, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And that voice began to talk to him. And it said in verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning, the first and the last. What thou seest write in a book. By this time he had not seen any figure. He had not seen anyone. He was just hearing the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he became inquisitive, interested. He wanted to see who was talking to him. Who is this that the voice looked like a trumpet? And it sounded like multitude of the roaring of the waters. And then in verse 12, he said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw. And what did he see? He began to see some symbolic things. And then he said, I saw the seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. But you must understand that John had seen the Son of Man about 60 years before. When Jesus Christ was in the days of humiliation. When he was walking the streets of Galilee. When he was going to Jerusalem and Jericho and all those other places. Going about, doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. But now what John saw was totally different. Because he said, I saw this like unto the Son of Man. In verse 13, it's clothed with a garment. And down to the foot, and girt about with paths with a golden girdle. What am I seeing here? It's, it looks like I'm looking at a prophet. I'm looking at a prince. I'm looking at a priest. Because the prophets of those days and the priests of those days, this is exactly how they dress. But then it's some more than a prophet, and more than a priest, and more than a king. His head and his hairs were as white like snow, as white as snow, and his eyes like unto a flame of fire he said what he saw he saw like he saw the ancient of days because he was a student of the bible because daniel had seen the ancient of days in this same picture before here is the almighty here is the one that said i and my father are one that is is the same with the almighty is the same with the god of heaven in fact he said i am alpha and omega exactly the same titles that almighty god had claimed and he also said i'm the first and the last in different chapters in isaiah almighty god himself had claimed the same title what was john seeing here then the eyes were as a flame of fire penetrating eyes searching eyes penetrating like laser light that will go into the hearts of every man in the whole universe and in verse 15 his feet was like unto fine brass as they bunch in a furnace it's like this one that has majesty and honor and glory and power it's like he comes as a judge and then is able to thread the wine press of the lord in ditching out and outpouring the wrath and the indignation of god and he said his voice is as a sound of many waters and he had in his right hand seven stars. You look at the stars and he says the seven stars were in his right hand. Later the Lord will explain what the stars meant. That the stars were the leaders and the angels of the churches. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. That was the sword that he will use to cut down the rebellious nations of the world. And to judge the unrepentant, impenitent sinners of the world. His countenance was as the sun shineth 
in his strength. That's what he saw. What was the effect on John when he saw this? He said, when I saw him, he knew he was seeing the Lord. But this is different from the Son of Man. This is the very Son of God, the God of glory. He said, when I saw him, guess what happened to me? No strength in me anymore. I fell at his, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. See the glorified Son of God. This is the glorified Christ. It is glory in his exaltation, in his majesty, in the way he will appear in the future. When he appears to judge the world and to judge the nations, great fear came upon John. In fact, it had a great effect upon him. You know that this John had known the Lord Jesus Christ. He had had intimate fellowship with him in the days of his earthly ministry. In the days of his humiliation, this was the disciple that Jesus loved very dearly and he loved the Lord too. According to the flesh, that is when, when you think about, you know, their relationship in the flesh, their mothers were sisters. That made John and Jesus first cousins, a beloved disciple indeed that was in the inner circle. And he lived very close near to the heart of Jesus. And now he laid, at that time he laid, he said, on Jesus' bosom at the last supper. He stood at the cross and in obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ, he took Mary, the mother of Jesus, to his home and he cared for her. He had even seen the risen Christ after his resurrection and he was not overwhelmed by his glory. You think about it, that he had met with the, with the Lord Jesus Christ, the doors were closed and Jesus came in and said, peace be unto you. Look at my hands, look at my side and see that I am he. And it wasn't this overwhelmed. He didn't fall to the ground. At that time, they just rejoiced. And they, they had peace in their heart. But at this time now, he was seeing Christ in the fullness of his glory. He was seeing Christ. And when he saw Christ, it was the Alpha and the Omega that he saw. He saw the Sovereign Lord. He saw the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in his majesty and future glory. He saw the first and the last. He was seeing one equal to the Ancient of Days. He saw Christ. Seeing Christ in the fullness of his glory, in the fullness of his power, in the fullness of his authority, he was seeing deity unveiled. The curtain had been drawn away. And what was the impact of that on John? No other thing he could do. He just fell flat at the feet of Jesus as if he were dead. Now tell me, if a loyal, faithful disciple became so fearful, when he saw the glorified Christ and he fell down as if he had died, how will the sinner react when he sees Jesus Christ on the judgment seat? Because Jesus Christ is going to judge this whole world. The Father had committed all judgment into his son. And when that day comes, the people who have refused and rejected Christ, what will be their Lord? Well, let's come back to John. As John fell down, then the Lord assured, reassured him. And it says here that when I fell at his feet as dead, he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. After the Lord had given him reassurance and comfort with a touch from the hand of the Lord, then he had been strengthened now. He was prepared for further ministry. So the Lord said, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And then the Lord began immediately to give him explanation, interpretation of what he had seen in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven golden candlesticks, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. So then, after reassurance, the Lord Jesus Christ commissioned him. That he should go into this ministry of writing the revelation. Send that revelation to the churches in Asia Minor. And through them to send the revelation to you and to me. We're going to look at the study today in three perspectives. That is on a three subtitles. Today we're tackling the message reassurance and commissioned by Christ. Reassurance by Christ and commissioned by Christ. We have divided the passage or the, the, the thing we're studying into three parts. Number one, the conqueror. Christ the Lord. Number two, the keys of Christ the Lord. Number three, the command of Christ the Lord. Let's come back to number one. Number one, the conqueror. Christ the Lord. Here is Jesus Christ. And as he appeared to John the beloved, he didn't appear as somebody that was still suffering, humiliated, and 
carrying the cross and bending before the weight of the cross and falling under the weight of the cross and being at the mercy of Pilate or Herod or anybody, he came as a king and as the Lord. And it says in verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Uh, by the way, when you think about the reaction of John, it will not surprise you if you're a student of the Bible. The people who have seen the Lord of glory before him, they had the same reaction. In fact, if you look at Daniel, in Daniel chapter 8, you will see what happened to Daniel when he saw a similar revelation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When he saw a similar revelation of the Almighty, the Ancient of Days. Look at this. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 26. And the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision. For it shall be for many days, that is, the fulfillment is still coming. There will be, still be many, many days, that is, even years and decades and centuries and millennia, before those things will be fulfilled. Here was the reaction of Daniel when he saw that vision, just similar to that of John. And I, Daniel, fainted. I was sick certain days afterward I rose and did the king's business and I was astonished I was surprised and amazed at the vision but none understood it even though they didn't understand the vision at that time because the fullness of time had not come yet it still had such an impact on Daniel that he said I fainted there was no strength in me at all in Daniel chapter 10 he saw the vision again and you see the impact is still had on him it doesn't matter how many times you see the vision of the Lord. It's still going to have a great, great impact on you. You'll be overwhelmed. And you'll fall to the ground. You will see yourself and see your nothingness when you see the almightiness of the almighty God. In chapter 10 of Daniel, reading from verse 5, it says, Then I lifted up mine eyes, and I looked. And behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were guarded with fine gold of offers. His body also was like burial, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to burnish to polish brass. When you read this, isn't this similar to what John saw eh, on the Isle of Patmos in Revelation chapter 1? And Daniel continues to describe what he saw. And the voice of his words, like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, was alone when I saw the vision. And the men, that is, I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell on them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Even the people that didn't see the full of what Daniel saw. They didn't see the glory, the majesty of the Almighty that Daniel saw. The presence of God in that vision made those people that he didn't even see anything to quake and tremble. And it, and it fell upon them. And they ran away because they couldn't endure the presence and the power, the majesty, the glory of the Almighty revealing himself to Daniel. Therefore, he, he said, I was left alone. And I saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me. For my comeliness was turned in me into corruption. And I retained no strength. Can you see the same impact on Daniel? Beloved Daniel, sinless Daniel, perfect, holy Daniel. And even God Almighty attested to his innocence and holiness. But all the same, when he saw the majesty of the Almighty, when he saw the glory of the Almighty, he said, I retained no strength in me, yet had I the voice of his words. When I had the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, and hand touched me. Isn't this similar uh, to what John, what happened to John? The Lord always wanting to give reassurance and comfort when we are devastated, when we are overwhelmed with the vision of the Almighty. Behold, and hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hand. And he said, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee and stand upright for unto thee am i now sent and when he had spoken this word unto me i stood trembling then said he unto me fear not fear not daniel exactly the way the lord dealt with john he told john fear not i'm alpha i'm omega and i'm the first and the last there is nothing for you to fear i'm not coming to you to judge you i'm coming to you to give you revelation and to show you the glory of the coming king it says in verse 12 for from the first day 
that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come to for thy words. I go down to verse 15. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. And behold, one, like the similitude of the sons of men, touched my lips. And then I opened my mouth, and I spake, and said unto him that stood before me, O my Lord, by the vision my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. For how can the servant of this, my Lord, talk with this, my Lord? For as for me, straightway, there remained, there remained no strength in me. Neither is there breath left in me. Isn't that similar to what happened to John? He fell now as dead, as if no strength and no breath remained in him. And when you see this, you understand then, when we actually see the glory of the Lord, I will see the vision of the Lord, it has a great, great impact on us. You know, there are some people running around and they tell us that they saw Jesus Christ and by what you see in their lives, there's no impact at all. And there is no devastation. And there is no move to holiness and move to total surrender unto the Lord. Many of those people, they don't know what they have seen. Or they have not seen anything at all. In verse 18, it says, Then there came a game and touched me, one like the appearance of a man. And he strengthened me. And he said, O oh man greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong. Yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened. And he said, let my, and said, let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Exactly what happened to John uh, many, many years after. After the Lord had touched him, comforted him, reassured him, strengthened him. He now gave him commission as to what now he will do. In fact, even those who have not seen the Lord, those who have not seen the Son of Man, the Son of God, king the king glorified in his majesty even those who saw ordinary angels that were sent to them they had such fear upon them and they had such trembling it overwhelmed them not to talk of seeing the king of glory and the lord of laws and the god of all glory and honor and majesty look at gideon when he saw the angel of the lord see the impact it had on him when you look at judges chapter 6 Judges chapter 6, verse 22. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, At last, O Lord God, for because I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. He felt, well, I don't think I'll remain alive, because God is holy, and his angels, his servants, his messengers are holy. If I see a holy God, he has seen my holiness. If I see the fullness, the might, and the majesty of the Lord, He has seen my nonentity and my nothingness. He has seen my weakness and my, and my frailty. And it means that I'm going to be crushed to death. And so the Lord said, No, I'm not coming to you for the purpose of judging you. Peace be unto you. Fear not, thou shalt not die. And you will see that even Zacharias, when you come to Luke chapter 1, when he saw the glory of the Lord to you, in the angel that was sent to him, he trembled. And even though the Bible says he had been walking in the word of the Lord, in the law of the Lord, he had been walking without any blame, without any blemish. Yet, when he saw the angel of the Lord, it had such a great, great impact on him. The point we're making is, many of these people that maybe they are writing some literature, some books, some tracts, and they say they saw the vision of heaven, they saw the glory of God, and they saw the angels, and uh, you, you find that in their lives, there's no fear of God. They are not overwhelmed by what they say they have seen. And then they have not fallen down under the mighty hand of God at the feet of the Lord, saying, Lord, you've seen my nothingness. I've seen your almightiness. You've seen my unholiness. I've seen your holiness. Uh, you have seen my frailty and my humanness. I've seen your glory. And then they are almost uh, saying, I'm, I'm undone, like, like I say. Because I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean leaves, and then the angel will flow to them, will come to them and touch their leaves with a coal of fire from the altar of the Lord, so that they will be purged and they will be sanctified and made pure. But all these people just telling us lies, and they say, I've seen the Lord, I've seen the Lord, and it doesn't have any impact on them. Those are lies. Don't, don't take those things serious. These are the people that really saw the majesty, the glory of the Lord. Look at this. In Luke chapter 1, I read to you from verse 6, so that uh, you understand who these people are. Zechariah, and it says, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, 
blameless. It's such an holy man like this that saw an angel in verse 11, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right hand of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel of the Lord said, Fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayers are heard, is heard, their, thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Uh, can you see here, when these people, righteous people, people that were following the Lord, when they saw real angel, uh, not just a uh, fake, not, not just something counterfeit, when they saw real angel sent from the Lord, fear came upon them. And whether it's in the Old Testament or it's in the New Testament. We we're told in Luke chapter 2. And see when the shepherds, when they also saw the angel that made announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. See the effect on them. And there in verse 8, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field. Keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were so afraid. You've seen these people that say they've seen visions and they've seen the glory of the Lord. They've seen God. They've seen heaven. They've seen hell. Some of them say they have gone to hell and they have come back. And when you see the frivolity in their lives, you see the unholiness and the sin in their lives, the carelessness and the prayerlessness in their lives, and the lack of righteousness and the lack of the fear of God in their lives, you doubt very much whether they have seen anything. But you see, when these ones saw the glory of the Lord shining around about, and they saw the angel of the Lord, they were so afraid, until the angel said unto them in verse 10, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. So then, we will see the effect of the revelation that John was receiving. And that makes you to know that John saw something real. John saw something real. Because when the Lord Jesus Christ was here on earth, he had seen Christ in his earthly ministry. And he had seen Jesus Christ even carrying the cross. He had seen the Lord dying in humiliation, dying for our sins. And he saw all those things, and yet at that time, he wasn't, he wasn't uh, so uh, prostrated like this uh, in the presence of the Lord. And he even saw Jesus Christ after his resurrection. And he had seen, but all those things that he saw, the Lord was telling him, John, you have not seen the last of me. You have not seen the last of me. You think you are familiar with me. When you are leaning your head on my breast, on my bosom, you think you know everything about me. And all that you are preaching in the, in the gospel according to St. John, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John, you think you have seen something. John, you have not seen the last of me. Let me show you a little of what is still to come concerning Christ the Lord. And you know, unless we are changed and transfigured, and until these corruptible shall put on incorruption, and these mortals shall put on immortality, if we too, if we behold the Lord in his divinity and, and dignity, and unveiled glory, will also fall down to the ground as if we were dead. Come back to uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. It says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. And John must be very familiar with this now because he had seen the Lord Jesus Christ in his earthly ministry. And what did Jesus do in his earthly ministry? He will touch the blind. He will touch the dead. And then, that is, he will touch the bear, the coffin, that is carrying the dead. That's in Luke chapter 7. And then, the, the dead will rise. And now Jesus Christ touched him. And he recognized that touch. That's the tender touch of the Lord. When he saw the glory of the Lord and deity unveiled, and then he saw that shining, shining glory like the sun, and was looking into the eyes of the judge of all the earth. Those eyes are burnt like the flame of fire. And when he saw Christ in the fullness of his glory and power, and he became conscious of his nothingness and insignificance, and he fell at his feet, then that hand touched him. And then comfort came, reassurance came, and strength came. And he realized, this is my Lord. This is my Lord. He will judge the world, but he will reward me. And he's going to speak in his fury. And he's going to tread upon the sinners with his feet like burnt brass, like a polished bronze. And yet he's going to still keep on touching me. And I'm going to still have him fellowship with him. When you think about this, you think it's only the believers that will have such comfort and reassurance in the presence of the Lord. The unbelievers, the backsliders, the sinners, the impenitent ones, 
and they'll be like an ins they'll be like insects. Or when they get near the blazing light and the consuming heat of the sun, because our God is a consuming fire. And frail man will recognize the same significance in his humanity when he comes directly in the presence of omnipotence and omniscience. He will fall down in awe and reverence and godly fear. Only that at that time, for sinners, it will be too late. But for those of us who are children of God, you will wonder when you see the majesty and the glory and the honor of the Lord. But please understand in the presence of deity, all flesh is as grass. That's exactly what John is revealing here. But the Lord is able to strengthen you in your weakness. He's able to strengthen you when you fall down as if you are dead, as if there's no strength in you anymore. And that's the reassurance that came to him. Fear not, I am the first and the last. That title of the Lord Jesus Christ, look at that. It says, I am the first and the last. The Lord had introduced himself like this even earlier in verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. That he is, is the first and he is the last. That means then that as you look at Jesus Christ, uh, Alpha is the beginning of the Greek alphabet and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. That means it's the beginning and it's the end. And it's everything in between. Anything you are going to write. In fact, the plan of God and the fulfillment of prophecy will culminate and climax in the life and the ministry and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ because it's the first nothing before him and it's the last there'll be nothing after him and when all is said and done and when the history of the world comes into climax jesus christ will still be there because he is alpha and omega he is the first and the last and then he tells us in verse 18 something about himself he says i am he that liveth and was dead ah john can understand now um, he's seen the one that went to the cross. He's seen the one that died on the cross. He's seen the one that was buried and was buried for three days. And then he rose again and said, I am alive forevermore. He said, I am he that liveth. And you know, I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. The reassurance that came to John is that this is the Jesus that died before. He died because of our sins. But he rose again for justification, and is gone to heaven, seated on the right hand of majesty on high, because of his glorification. In, in Revelation chapter 2, reading verse 8, it says, Unto the angel of the church is man right. These things, says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive is still emphasizing the same thing in fact to the very end of revelation is still emphasizing the same title of the lord jesus christ in revelation chapter 22 verse 13 i am alpha and omega the beginning and the end the first and the last and then he assures us that he's living forever he lives forever in fact as you go on in the book of revelation you will see how the hosts of heaven and everyone that has breath, angels and redeemed raptured men, how all of them shouted to the Lord that he lives forever and ever. Revelation chapter 5, reading from verse 11, And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, the living creatures, and the elders, the 24 elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb this is our christ again this is a redeemer again this is the son of god again this is a glorified christ again worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them had i seen that is everyone in the whole universe they left every other thing and all of them in unison they said blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that seated on the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever and the four bees said amen and the four and twenty elders they fell down they worshipped him that liveth forever and ever that means the lord jesus christ will continue forever and ever let me have a good amen because the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he comes, he's not coming as somebody that is, you know, just going to be walking around and they're going to hang on the cross again and they're going to do whatever they want. He will be coming as the king of glory and the possessor of heaven and earth. In Revelation chapter 11 verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he 
shall reign. How long? Forever and ever. If you are born again, I rejoice with you. That's your Lord. That's your King. And that's the one that says, if you overcome, you will reign with me just as I have overcome. And I'm seated on the throne of my Father. Let's come back to Revelation chapter 1 as we go to point number 2. The keys of Christ the Lord. As uh, the Lord Jesus Christ spoke about himself in the latter part of verse 18, he mentioned something very, very significant. Look at it. I read from the beginning of verse 18. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Think about that. And I have the keys of death and of hell. Here is the Lord Jesus Christ and he's telling us something here. And when you think about the key and here is not, this is not the first this is not the only place where he mentioned the key. A look at uh, chapter 3 of Revelation. Chapter 3 of Revelation verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these six says, he that is holy, he that is true, he that has the key of David. And then he tells us the significance of that key. He that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth he that shutteth and no man openeth he that openeth and no man shutteth you begin to think about it then you say uh -uh, what does that mean he has the key and when he has the key there is no duplicate the only key the unique key the universal key is given to jesus christ it's in the hand of the lord jesus christ and he says when he opens with that key nobody can close and when he shuts with that key nobody can open what does that mean for you to understand why don't you go to genesis and go to the beginning of the bible and see something here that happened and and see the authority and the control and the power and the majesty and the finality that rest in the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ in Genesis chapter 7. I'm reading to you from verse 16. This is the story of the flood. And this is the time when Noah had gone into the ark. And then we're told something about the Lord. I'll tell you when we get to that verse in Genesis chapter 7 verse 16. And in window shall in Genesis chapter 7 verse 16. It says, And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh as God had commanded him. And the Lord shut him in. See that? The Lord shut the door. And even Noah could not open that door. And the, the sons of Noah could not open that door. And nobody from the outside that they were perishing in the flood, they might knock at the ark. And they might say, open to us. And they'll say, I'm sorry. I want to do it, but I, can, I cannot do it. The key is not in my hand. Almighty God himself, he shut him in. He had, he had closed the door. He had locked the door of the ark. And nobody could open it. And Jesus is saying, when the final day comes, and he opens the door, then the redeemed of the Lord will march in. When the saints go marching in, I pray you will be there. And when, when the last soul, when the last soul, the repentant people, the righteous people, redeemed people, when they get in, that's all. He shuts the door because he has the key. He has the key. He has the final authority. He tells us something like that in his Bible in Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. We're looking at the parable that he told. And he told this parable concerning the kingdom of God. He tells us in that Matthew chapter 25, reading from verse 10. Eh, you, you know the story. There were ten, poli there are ten virgins. Five were foolish and five were wise. And then the people that were wise, they prepared themselves and they had extra oil. And when the bridegroom came, then they entered in. The foolish people did not have enough oil, so they went to buy. And then they came back saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Look at it now in verse 5. And why? Verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. The key is in the hand of the Lord Jesus, brothers and sisters. If you want to get saved, this is the time. While the door of his mercy is open, while the Lord is calling you, while the Lord is pleading with you, while the key is in the hand of the Lord and in mercy and in love and in grace, is still opening the door for everyone that will repent. This is the time to get in. If you delay and then the rapture takes place, when the Lord shuts the door, nobody can open it again afterward. In verse 11 came also the other virgins saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. 
They couldn't open them by themselves. And the white virgins couldn't open for them. And angels couldn't open for them. They knew that the key was in the hand of the Lord. Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch ye therefore. Uh, watch ye therefore. For ye know not, neither the day nor the hour when cometh uh, uh, the Son of Man. When the Son of Man cometh. So the Lord is telling us then that he has the key. The key. And when he shuts the door, there is no crossing over. After someone is dead, is appointed unto man. Wants to die. After this, the judgment. We read the story of this man in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. And there was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and feared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of souls, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the souls. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich, the rich man died also. And he was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saith Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. He didn't understand. That the key was not in the hand of Abraham. The key is not in the hand of David. And the key is not in the hand of prophet Elijah. The key is not in the hand of anyone. It's the king of kings. The lord of lords. Jesus Christ that has the key. And he has not opened the door for Lazarus to go to the other side. Neither can he open the door for those on the other side to come to Abraham's bosom. Because once they die, Christ has the final sin. He has the final authority. He has the key of hell and of death. But Abraham said in verse 25, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy, thy good things and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great God fixed. So that they which will pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. It is a time of opportunity. If you want to enter into the kingdom of God, Christ is opening the door now. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can repent. You can turn from all your evil ways and come to the Lord while the door is still open. Now, it says that Jesus Christ has the key of hell and of death. As you look at the notes, it says the keys are a symbol of authority. When somebody has a key, that's the person that has authority. And it's a symbol of control. When somebody has a key, that's the person in control. And it's a symbol of possession. He possesses the kingdom. That's why he opens the door to whosoever he wills. And he shuts the door against whosoever he doesn't want to come in. That is the unrepentant sinners. And it's a symbol of government. In the days of old, actually, when a king came to one of his royal cities, the major... The mayor representing the people will present to his majesty, that is to the king, a key to the town. The mayor and the people, by presenting the key to the king, what were they doing? They were acknowledging him to be the rightful reigning lord of that city. It's as though a tenant was surrendering the key to the landlord. Christ has the keys. He's the landlord. Everything belongs to him. And then the key had been given to him by the father. He rules by right. He rules in fact. He is the king over all. And all the issues of death and hell are under his control. Because he has overcome. He has ultimate power. He has final power. Look at Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 2. Uh, you will see what he has done by his death on the cross. And you will see the majesty and the authority and the honor that came upon him. Because of what he has done. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14. For as much then 
as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. He also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that he is the devil. He has final authority now, that the devil cannot open a door that Christ has closed. And the devil cannot close a door that Christ has opened and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject unto bondage. As concerning the issues of death, that everything lies in the hand of the Lord, I want you to see in the Psalms, Psalm 68 and verse 20. Psalm 68, verse 20. And you'll see that the issues of death are in the hands of the Lord Almighty himself. It says, He that is our God is the God of salvation. And unto God, the Lord, belong the issues from death. That is, everything is under his authority. The authority and the control of Christ, they are above the powers of death, above the powers of hell. Death and hell are under his control. The master hand of Christ holds the key. There is nothing in life. There is nothing in death. There is nothing in heaven. There is nothing in hell. There is nothing in time. There is nothing in the future that is not under the surveillance and the control of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Whether souls are damned and in torment in hell, or those souls are glorified and happy in heaven, he is the king over all. He is adored in heaven and is feared in hell. And that means as we look at Jesus Christ and it says, I have the keys of hell and of death. What's the meaning of that? It means that our lives are in the hands of Jesus Christ. He holds the key of death. And if, if it is not his will that a man die, neither sickness nor pestilence, no, a thousand demons could drag that man down to the grave. If God, if the Lord Jesus Christ has not opened that gate of death, that door of death, then there is nothing that the king can kill a real believer. The issues of death, they lie in the hands of the Almighty. Our Lord holds the key to the door of death. No man enters that door of death unless Christ, our Lord, shall open that door. And he has the key of hell as well. Those who reject the love of Christ. And they die in their sins and unbelief. They will confess in horror and in torment and in agony. In hell forever and ever. That Christ the Lord is king even over hell. He is king and he is Lord. He has full and final control over the damned in hell. The key, the authority and the control will someday even be used against the devil. That even the devil uh, will be put into the bottomless pit a thousand years. And then Christ will lock the door of the bottom lip speed against the devil against the dragon and then he cannot even come out after he's liberated a short time he will be finally cast into the lake of fire into damnation and torment to suffer forever and ever christ the lord has the keys he has ultimate control he has ultimate authority praise the lord and when that time comes, when that time comes, death, when Christ shuts the door against death and he makes death inoperative, then death will have no power at all. See how, how Paul the Apostle rejoices and he exclaims when that thing will happen and Christ will manifest his power over death and over hell. And then he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of the sin of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has the key. I said he has the key. In fact, this is according to prophecy because it had been prophesied since the time of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 22, reading verse 22, it had been prophesied that the key will be given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 22, verse 22, it says, And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. 
and he shall shut, and none shall open. That's the authority of Christ. That's the power of Christ. That's the majesty of Christ. That's the ability of Christ. Because of what has happened, the Lord has given him a name. Above every name that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That Jesus Christ has final, full, eternal authority. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Reading to you from verse 9. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him. And giving him a name above every name that at the, at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things and things in the earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord and to the glory of God the Father and you will see then the implication that Jesus Christ has the key, the key of hell and the key of death. I told you earlier that even this key is going to be used against the devil, against the dragon. And the devil is going to be put in the bottomless pit a thousand years. And when Christ shuts that door, even the devil will not be able to open that door. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven. Having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand, and he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set his seal upon him, and he and that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season so then you understand that this jesus we are worshiping this christ we are serving is the one that has authority is the one that has control is the one that has power and there is no power that can contradict or resist or limit the power of the lord jesus christ come back to revelation chapter one and as the reason jesus christ first of all revealed himself he wanted to assure john the beloved that all the revelation that he will see as you go on from chapter 4 to chapter 5 and chapter 6 all through to the end of the book and john may be wondering would it be possible will christ have the power to do all these glorious majestic devastating things that i'm recording in the revelation that's why he first of all revealed himself to john saying john you're not looking at the jesus who saw on the on the sides of galilee by the seashore when you were catching fish you're not seeing the same jesus that you ate with at the lord's supper that stooped now and washed your feet you're looking at the king of kings and the lord of lords and his alpha and his omega and his the force and his the last and there is no power beyond his power in fact he has a key to the whole universe because he controls even hell and death it brought reassurance to the heart of john that all the revelation I will be seeing after this time. This Christ has the final authority and the power to fulfill everything that I'm recording now. So come back to Revelation chapter 1. Reading from verse 17 once again. When I saw him, he saw him. He saw the glorified Christ, the exalted Christ. He saw him in his glorification and exaltation. He saw him in his splendor and in his glory. He saw him as he would be the coming judge of the whole earth. I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his hands right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am the he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I live, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. And that brings us now to point three. If the Lord has reassured him, if the Lord has strengthened him, if the Lord has revealed so much like this to him, what's he to do now? And he's teaching us a lesson if the Lord is revealing so much like this to us concerning Jesus Christ, the coming glory of the Lord, the coming splendor and majesty of the Lord. What's the reason for the Lord revealing this to us? It's because after the reassurance, there is a commission. After the assurance, there is a command. After the assurance, there is, a, there is an assignment that the Lord is given. Look at verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Uh, the Lord commanded him and commissioned him. Now you've seen something. Now you've seen my glory. Now you've seen my final authority. And now you've seen that there's no devil to fear. And there's no demon to fear. What I mean by this is that there is no need to fear the devil or to fear the demons. Because all power rests in the hands of the Lord. There is nothing to disturb you. There is nothing to hinder you. Go ahead now and do what I'm telling you to do. Write the things that you have seen. 
after the Lord had revealed his glory and power to John, he commanded him to write his great plan of the ages and then to send that to the churches. A look at verse 11. He had told him earlier in verse 11, he said, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. Uh, do, do, you see, do you see the connection here? First of all, he says, I am Alpha and Omega. On the basis of that, I can issue a command to you. I am the first and the last. On the basis of that, I can give you a commandment because I have the power to back up the precepts and the commandment that I give you. What thou seest, write in a book and send thee to the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pagamos and unto Tatyra and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And again, he tells him here now in, in verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen. As we look at what the Lord has told him to do, he told him to write, and then he divides what, it, what he told him to write into three parts. Look at verse 19. Number one, write the things which thou hast seen. That is, you've seen my glory. You've seen my exaltation. You've seen my majesty. Write that down. You've seen the vision of what I appear to be in glory. You've seen what I appear to be as a coming judge. You've seen the description that I am equal to the ancient of days. I'm equal to the Almighty. And the same title that the Almighty is. You've seen, I use the same title because there's divinity deity that is embedded in me. Write that down. That's the past. He's seen that already. Part two of what is to write. And the things which are. What are those things? Those are the churches. The, the church is in Ephesus. The, ch the church in Ephesus. The church in Smyrna. Those are the things that are. And the church in Pagamos and the church in Tatyra. Those things, they were present at that time. That's the thing of the present age. And the thing in Sardis and Laodicea and Philadelphia. Write the things that are. That's the second part of the commission that was given unto John. Number one, the past. Number two, the present. But John, don't stop yet. There's still something you are going to do. And this is the part three of your assignment. And the things which shall be hereafter. The things which shall be after the church age. I'll be revealing that to you. But I'm going to tell you first. I've told you number one. The things that you have seen. That's my glory. That's my splendor. That's my majesty. Write that down. But I'm going to reveal the present things to you concerning the message to the church. And then after that, when I reveal the present things to you, I'll be revealing the future to you. What will be taking place after the church age. That will stretch all through to Revelation chapter 22. Now, this commandment that he told him to write. If you look at chapter 2, he continues to tell him, write it down, write it down. He didn't say because he had told him before, just give him a blanket commandment and says, well, and say, I've told you already, so you know you have to write everything. He kept on telling him, write it, write it, write it. In chapter 2, verse 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus, write. And then in verse 8, he says, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write it, write. And then he tells us in verse 12, and unto the angel of the church in Pagamos, write. And then he goes to verse 18, and he must still command him again unto the angel of the church in Tatyra, write. And when you come to chapter 3, in chapter 3, verse 1, unto the angel of the church in Sardis, write. In verse 7, unto the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write. Then in verse 14, it says, unto the angel of the church of, of the church of the Laodiceans, write. And the commandment was given to him every time. John, write this one down. John, write this one one down and then he tells us in verse 22 he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches all those things that have been written to us we need to have ears and we need to listen now there's a pattern here now uh, the pattern is this whenever the lord showed his ministers whenever the lord showed his prophets the things that were still to be and the prophecies of great things and great events of the future he always told those ministers and those leaders and those servants and those prophets to write down so that the people of god will be able to read that and prepare for that coming event in fact since the time of moses in deuteronomy chapter 31 deuteronomy chapter 31 reading from verse 19 now therefore write ye this song for you and teach ye the children of israel and put ye it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the children of israel for when I shall have brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers that fled with milk and honey, 
and they shall have eaten and filled themselves and waxing fat then will they turn unto other gods and serve them and provoke me and break my covenant the Lord knew that they were going to backslide and the Lord knew that they were going to forsake him and he said Moses before you go you will write it down these things will happen in the future write it down that when it happens the children of Israel will realize that it had been written and predicted and prophesied even before it happened in verse 21 it says and it shall come to pass when many evils and troubles have befallen them they song that they song shall testify against them as a witness for it shall not be forgotten out of the mouths of the seed for I know know their imagination which they go about even now before i have brought them into the land which i swear verse 22 and moses moses therefore wrote this song the same day and he taught each to the children of israel so uh, the thing that was still future the lord will tell his servants and will tell his ministers to write those things uh, it's the same way that the lord dealt with isaiah and there were some coming events and the Lord wanted us to write everything down so that the people of God will be able to reach that. And what a ministry the Lord is giving to us today. Some great, great things the Lord is doing in our midst. Write them down. And then, you know, these messages and all these doctrines, write them down, record them down so that it will be given to the coming generations until Christ will come. They will know this is what the Lord has said. This is what the Lord has taught keep on writing it and keep on writing it and when you write it you send it out unto the churches that the churches of God and the churches of Christ and the churches the people following the Lord they will know what the Lord has revealed and then they'll be able to pattern their lives according to the word of the Lord Isaiah chapter 30 I'm reading to you from verse 8 Isaiah 30 verse 8 now go write it before them in a table not it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever that is these prophecies they are not for limited times in fact it reveals if you read isaiah isaiah stretches out to the time when christ will establish his kingdom it stretches out to the time when the millennial reign will be when the lion will lose the barrel city and the wildness and be playing with a little child and it tells us of the time when there will be the new heavens and the new earth and the lord told isaiah write it down don't let it perish with you. The prophecy and the predictions I'm giving you. Write it in a book that it may be for the time to come, even forever and ever. And of course, the same thing with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was going to. He had revealed the revelation of the time when the great tribulation will take place. And the children of Israel, he said, I'm seeing something here. It's like these children of Israel, the suffering that will come upon them at the time of the great tribulation. The pain will be like a woman that is laboring, wanting to deliver. And yet this is happening to men. What am I seeing? Do men labor to bring forth children? Here is the pain of the great tribulation. And then God told uh, Jeremiah, write it down. In Jeremiah chapter 13, reading from verse 2, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 2. Thus spake the Lord, God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, says the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I give, that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel, concerning Judah. For thus says the Lord, we have had a voice of trembling and of fear and, of, uh, and not of peace. Ask ye now, see whether a man does travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. He's talking about the time of the great tribulation and the time of Jacob's trouble when they will be under great stress and great, great oppression and great persecution because of the troubles and the wrath and the devastations that will take place at the time of the great tribulation. But then he told Jeremiah, write it down, write it down, so that the coming generations will read about it and then they will prepare themselves for the coming of the Lord. In Habakkuk chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 2. Uh, when the Lord revealed anything, he always told his prophets, don't let it perish. Uh, write it down. Write it down. Then you spread it around. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision. Make it plain upon tables 
that he may run that readeth it. That is, let it have an effect the way you write it. So that the person that reads will know that this thing is going to come to pass. And the suffering is going to come upon the people that do not know the Lord. And the people that rebel against the Lord. And they will run as they read. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And that's what the Lord is saying. Come back to Revelation. In fact, uh, when John, the beloved, received all these things, the Lord kept telling him, write it down, write it down. He'll come to another important point again. I'll say, John, have you forgotten? Keep on moving and keep on writing and keep on walking. Write it down, write it down. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. The, the Lord is saying that the people that die in the Lord, tell them, encourage them, that blessed are the people that die in the Lord. Their righteous works and righteous deeds will be following after them. And I looked and beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. It's talking about when the Lord will come in glory and majesty, will bring judgment and harvest the harvest of the world and another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud thrust in thy sickle and reap for the time is come for thee to reap for the harvest of the earth is ripe and he that sat on the clouds referring to the lord jesus christ as a great judge of of the whole universe it says he thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped as we come to Revelation chapter 19, the Lord is still giving him the commandment to keep on writing. Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 9, And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he says unto me, These are the true saints of God. You see how the Lord had been commanding John, and even though he was in the Isle of Patmos, and he was uh, suffering persecution, and the Lord was saying, Don't let your persecution mean anything to you. Just look at my glory and look at my majesty. Understand that Emperor Domitian does not have the final say. I have the final say. I have the key in my hand. Forget about the persecutor and do what I'm telling you to do and write all this vision down. And then in verse 10, John forgot himself. He said, I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, see thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren and that have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What happened there is that as John saw the revelations and saw the revelations and even saw the angel that, uh, all that Jesus Christ had sent. And then the, 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 the thing was so marvelous and majestic in his sight. He forgot himself and he fell to worship the angel revealing the things to him. And the angel said, don't do that, don't do that. I'm just one of the servants of the Lord and I've come to reveal these things to you. Worship the Lord. And I saw heaven open. And behold, the white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. And then it says, and he was closed to where is a vesture dipped in blood. It's talking about Jesus Christ. And his name is called the Watch of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses and clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he shall smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty god and he has on his vesture and on his tie in him written king of kings and lord of lords and so you will see then how the commandment kept on coming to john to write the things that he saw and it was because he obeyed the lord that's why you are reading it today what if you didn't obey the lord what if he was careless? What if he was tired? What if he behaves like many Christians are behaving today that the Lord gives a commandment? Do it. And they don't do it when it is fresh on their mind. They don't do it when it is fresh and they can still have the energy and the memory to remember everything. But at the time that John told, John was told, write it down. He never wasted time. He did it immediately. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5. Revelation 21 verse 5, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. He says, I make all things new. 
tell the people of the world and tell my church and tell my people that I'm going to make all things new. Are they suffering persecution? Tell them to endure because I'm soon going to make all things new. Are they going through some temptations and trials? Tell them to endure because it will soon be over. I'm going to make all things new. Write it and let them read. In verse 6, and he said unto me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that success of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh, I pray you will overcome. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. John, write that down. Encourage those people so that in their fight against sin, in their fight against the devil, in their fight against the world and against the flesh, against their temptation, in their fight they will have the grace to overcome because they will know what lies ahead of them. He that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. But John, write also for them and let them understand the people that uh, cringe and the people that become cowards and the people that become fearful and the people that compromise because they cannot stand the storm and they cannot stand the persecution. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers and the all mongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Uh, you see what the Lord is uh, telling, what he has told John, the incomparable Christ. He first identified himself as a sovereign Lord of all. And then he commanded John to write, number one, write the vision of Christ. Number two, write the message to the churches throughout the church age. And then number three, write the prophecy and the revelation of the things which will surely be fulfilled hereafter, that is, after the church age, the great executor of the divine plan. The Lord himself, he affirms that these things are certainly going to come to pass. And the Lord of all, the one who has the key of hell and of death, he commissioned John on the basis of the authority and the divine ability to execute his plan. He said, write it down. Write it down. And send it to the churches and to the people that they may know, that they may receive comfort and encouragement. Now, John has written it in obedience to the Lord. And we are now to do something about it. It's not in your hand. You have to read it. You have to hear it. You have to keep it. You have to gird it. You have to obey it. Not only that, you have to send it to all other people as well. See what the Lord is telling us before we pray in Revelation chapter 22. Now that everything has been given to us and we have a responsibility towards what has been delivered into our hands. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you. These things and the churches and the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit of God is saying, come. If you are not born again yet. And the bride of Christ. As we look at the marriage of the Lamb. And we look in a panoramic view of all that John has written and recorded now. And we see the joy and the glory and the reward awaiting us. Then we are stretching the hand of, him, of invitation to the sinners who have not known the Lord. We are saying with the spirit of the Lord, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst and come. And whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. But now understand, I testify to every man that heareth the words of, this pro of the prophecy of this book. John has done his part. And John has been very faithful. He's reaching everything down. And now he's come to your hand. And he's coming to your hearing. And the Lord is saying, I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things. You don't see anything. You are saying you have seen something. And then you add another prophecy, another revelation to pollute the real uh, revelation of the Lord. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, uh, you read some of these things, uh, the destructions and devastation, the disaster that will come upon the world at the time of the great tribulation. And you say, that's too much. That's too much. How can God do that? And then you water them down. You take them away. John has been faithful. He has reached everything as he has seen everything as he, it was given to him by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you now read and say, no, I don't think it will be like that. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. What are we to do then? We're just to read, we're to hear, we're to heed, we're to keep, we're to obey. And then we're to pass it on exactly as it's given unto us. 
That's why we have the blessedness of the people that read and the people that hear and the people that keep the prophecy that the Lord is giving us in Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep and guard and protect and obey those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Who knows when the trumpet will sound? These prophecies were studying now. That the Lord has directed us to study the book of Revelation at this time. And has given us of his spirit. The spirit of understanding. The spirit of wisdom. And the spirit of knowledge. To reveal unto us the things that will shortly come to pass. Who knows before we finish the book of Revelation. Whether the Lord will come. The question is will you hear? Will you heed? Will you obey? Will you pass it on to other people? So that as we are getting prepared for the coming of the Lord. You'll help other people to get prepared to you. Won't you prepare tonight? Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord, I want to be ready when the Lord will come. See the majesty of the Lord. See the glory of the Lord. See the revelation of the Lord. And see what John is seeing. You see it having the same impact upon you. The same effect upon you. When John saw that glory and majesty and splendor of the Lord Jesus Christ, he fell down at the feet of Jesus as if he died. And then the Lord had to touch him, to reassure him, to strengthen him, to comfort him, and to recommission him again. Won't you allow the Lord to touch you tonight? Won't you allow the Lord to touch you tonight? Before you go, let him touch you, let him touch you. When he touches you like he touched John, then all your shackles will be broken. And then all your sins will be forgiven. Then your weakness will turn into strength. You'll be able to sing, He touched me. Oh, He touched me. And all the joy that floods my soul. Something happened. Something will always happen. And now I know that He touched me and He made me whole. 